Hey, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about simple harmonic motion equations, specifically looking at the velocity equation and the acceleration equation for simple harmonic motion. We're going to talk about what these things mean, how to use these equations, and even where they come from in terms of derivation. And I do want to start off with a animation from a great site called OPhysics, and I'll link that in the description below. But let's go ahead and take a look at this. So what you're going to see is an object in simple harmonic motion that's moving back and forth. So this is a mass on a spring system. And I do want to focus on the three graphs that you'll see in the upper right. So the yellow, the blue, and the purple position versus time, velocity versus time, and acceleration versus time graphs. So I want you to start thinking about when these things have maximums and minimums, what exactly that means for the corresponding graph that relates to it. The other graph that would be below it, for instance, in this case, how do we get velocity versus time in regards to position versus time, for instance. So we're going to be talking about these things and how to use these equations, so let's go ahead and get to it. And we left off last time with a equation. So this is one way of writing the equation. Here's another way of writing the equation for position versus time for an object in simple harmonic motion. The only difference between these two in terms of the way that they've been written is this is what's on your equation sheet for AP Physics C Mechanics. And this is what it's more commonly written as, and some would say more easily understood. This A in this case represents a maximum amplitude, which is the same concept as this X max over here. It's just written differently, that's all. So what we want to do is ask ourselves, how do we get to velocity versus time when we have a position versus time function? What do you think? Well, if you've had some calculus, the solution should be pretty clear. You're going to be taking the derivative of the position versus time equation. So first of all, this x max is a constant. We can actually draw that out of the derivative, but we get to a point where we're kind of stuck here. and We do need to talk about something that you may not have thought about for a long time. Notice we've got a function, an outer function, and an inner function here. What we need to do with that is use the chain rule. What we're going to do is you could say the derivative of an outer function with respect to the inner function is equal to the derivative of the outer function with the inner function left alone times the derivative of the inner function. So let me show you how this works in this case. We take the derivative of the outer function. The derivative of cosine ends up being negative sine, and we're leaving the inner function alone. And then we're going to take the derivative of the inner function. Well, in this case, it's with respect to time. Well, the derivative of the inner function then with respect to time would just be omega. So we're going to say this is what we're left with for our velocity versus time equation. And if we wanted to write it in a little more user-friendly language, that's what we could use over here for amplitude. This equation is not on your equation sheet, and you're going to need to know how to get here or have it memorized one of the two if you're an AP Physics C student. I do want to say as well, I want you to focus on the idea that you can have a maximum velocity where you have your amplitude times your omega over here. That's what this is saying. Amplitude times omega is going to give you your maximum and a minimum velocity values. And so let's see how to apply the same concepts to an acceleration versus time situation. So we just derived the velocity versus time equation for a simple harmonic motion. There it is right there. How would we get to the acceleration versus time function from the velocity versus time function? Well, again, we're going to take the derivative, right? I'm going to show you graphically what this looks like in a moment, just to refresh everyone's memory. So taking the derivative here, what we would need to do is pull out any constants that we have. This delta x max and omega are just constants that we can pull out. So we're going to do that in the front here. And again, we have the derivative of an outer function with the derivative of an inner function. So once again, we need to use the chain rule, just like before. And so there is the chain rule. We're going to say you take the derivative of the outer function, which is sine, and that's going to give you cosine over here. And you leave the inner function alone times the derivative of the inner function. In this case, it's with respect to t. So that would be just omega. So we can go ahead, take that omega out in front here, and we're going to end up with negative x max times omega squared times this business that's left over. So that's going to be our acceleration versus time equation. This is the other version if you want to use A representing amplitude. Note that we could say the maximum amount of amplitude that would be experienced would be x max times omega squared. 
or you could say the amplitude times omega squared. That'll give you your maximum and minimum values. If you consider this to be like plus or minus values, you get the maximum and the minimum acceleration values. And so let's take that information and look at it graphically. Let's remind ourselves of what this would look like graphically. If we went ahead and plotted a position versus time graph based on this equation right here, you would fundamentally get a cosine function. Now, of course, that cosine function would be modified by all the variables inside here. But for now, basically, we're working with this kind of graph. And again, our assumption is that you have a displacement to begin with. The beginning of the problem essentially has a displacement. If that is not the case, if you're starting from zero, you need to use phi, the phase constant, to adjust for that change. So next, I want you to think about, well, what would the velocity versus time graph look like based on this position versus time graph right here? Well, what you would do is start looking at various key points, like this point right here, and think about what the slope is, because the slope of a position versus time graph will represent the velocity at that time. So you could say right here, you've got a slope of zero. So our velocity versus time graph at this point should have a zero velocity. How about over here? Here is another key point. This would be the maximally negative point on our velocity versus time graph. So you would have a maximally negative point like right about here on the graph itself. How about over here? What kind of a slope do we have? Well, we've got a zero slope. So this part of the velocity versus time graph would have a zero value for the velocity. So let's take a look and see what it looks like. So if you take a look at this, Remember we said this had a zero slope, and so that would give us the zero value for the velocity at that instant of time. We said right here this was maximally negative. Well, that's our maximally negative value for the velocity. And we said over here, right about here, you also have a slope of zero. And if you take a look at the corresponding graph for velocity, it would have a zero value right here. Now we need to think about how do you do the same thing once again? How do you do this for acceleration versus time? How are you going to think through that? What you do is you take the velocity versus time graph and you find the slope at tangent lines to the velocity versus time graph. And those values are going to be acceleration values at those times. Again, we're just going to say right here, this is going to be a maximally negative value for the slope right here. So our acceleration should start out negative. Let's think about that in terms of position. If the position is maximally positive, displaced from equilibrium in a positive way, it actually makes sense that we would have a maximally negative acceleration because our force is going to be greatest in the opposite direction of the displacement. If you know something about Hooke's Law, you know that the direction of the force for something that's in simple harmonic motion is going to be in the negative direction. That's one other reason why we know that this is going to be a maximally negative value down here. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like. This is the corresponding value for both of these. You can reason through these types of things, and you may have conceptual or even math-based questions where you need to be able to do this on the fly and know this information for your test. Hopefully this has been helpful. If you have any comments down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.